so much yeah. and uh, namaskar to all of you uh, it's uh, and professor uh, god is doing great work on foreign policy issues and this initiative for start uh classes or lectures i think is again a great initiative and if you i've seen the program it's really impressive the subjects chosen and the variety chosen is excellent and and i think it will be really beneficial for uh, the students uh, to see and to learn from the the, the last the vast uh, canvas of uh, foreign policy issues and foreign policy uh, uh comes into play uh if you see you know now what i've been uh, what uh, i will be speaking on is uh, you can call it a diaspora diplomacy uh, as part of di diaspora dis diplomacy and i'll be speaking on indian diaspora's partnership with new india uh, now before we go ahead and talking about a few uh, i'm sure many of you are already aware of these things or maybe you're not i'm not but i should just mention a little bit about what constitutes diaspora and this diaspora concept is has been evolving over the years uh, it actually what, what do you understand by diaspora you are diaspora refers to individuals groups and communities of people who are dispersed from their original homeland to reside in other lands different from their own and, but they maintain strong links sometimes they maintain strong links sometimes they don't so these uh, are groups of people who have been for various reasons live, uh, made to live or migrate into another country which is not their own they can be defined as population of migrant origin dispersed from their original homeland to foreign countries a uh, diaspora are comprised of a complex and varied mix of people who have arrived in a particular host country at different times through different means including legal and illegal means you know so both the legal and illegal ones who have reached them then later on they become legal for whatever means or even asylum or family reunion education there are so many ways in which uh, diaspora are formed and when we talk about diaspora connect or diaspora partnership uh, we have to keep this in mind that there are different categories of diaspora and how they went from uh, india or from whichever country they go to uh, that is different each each category has its own unique characteristics its own unique uh, uh uh features and its own expectations from india and india's expectations from them are also different so if you look at uh, how uh, you know uh, diaspora from india has gone there's been there've been different waves and this uh, concept as i mentioned of the diaspora is evolving and we've had we also have what what we have say or how we term it as in informal new diaspora and the old diaspora the new diaspora is that which has gone in more recent times and they have gone as professionals to different countries or they've gone to uh, gone as you know on postings or they've gone you know temporary even temporary diaspora you have Uh, as um, uh, students or for you know on jobs for for uh, for um, short term assignments or you have the old, and on the other hand you have the old diaspora uh, the old diaspora is that which has been living which are descendants of those who had gone many many years ago many centuries ago uh, either as forced migrants i you know as slaves or indentured labor i if you've heard there was a system of indentured labor which uh, the french and the british had employed deployed to take people from india uh, it was another form i think of slavery and they were uh, taken there to to their plantations coffee plantations sugarcane plantations in different parts of the world uh, in in to reunion islands to madagascar to mauritius to uh, suriname and to many other other countries across into africa for for different reasons so they were they were a kind of forced migration uh, which which took place and their uh, descendants today comprise uh, comprise the um, diaspora today in different countries then as i said uh, coming back to the new diaspora uh, we also have categories within the new diaspora now those who went in the 60s and uh, 50s and 60s and 70s 
were a different kind of diaspora leaving India for greener pastures, so to speak. And they went and settled mainly in the US and in Europe, mainly. And, uh, and they were mainly professionals uh, in, across, uh, across uh, categories in, in medicine and in, uh, in engineering, in uh, uh, science, research, nuclear medicine, nuclear energy, sorry, not medicine, nuclear energy. So many different uh, uh, specific categories or very niche areas of uh, studies uh, were, uh, these people went to study for higher studies uh, to, to Europe or to the United States. And their descendants today comprise this, they and their descendants comprise uh, this new, um, uh, new uh, diaspora. But then you also have another category within the new diaspora, those who are semi-skilled and skilled, who have gone in large numbers to the Gulf areas, to the Gulf countries, to, to um, uh, UAE, to um, Saudi Arabia, etc. And they have gone uh, for, of course, economic reasons. I mean, mostly migration has taken place uh, for, my, um, uh, for migration, um, uh, for economic reasons, but whatever the reasons are, uh, they have gone more recently, and they are also con they also comprise the new diaspora. And then there's one more category I would just like to mention of voluntary migrants who again went many years ago, many some of them early uh, 19th century, 20th century, uh, who late 19th century, early 20th century, who were the Gujarati business persons, Gujarati traders who took sea routes, who took who to, went via the sea route and went into the Indian Ocean region according to the, the current of the, um, of, the, uh, of the sea currents, the air currents. Uh, so they would go to these, uh, these areas for trading, uh, including the, uh, the African coast and the Indian Ocean Islands. So they went to Mauritius, they went to uh, in Seychelles, they went to Madagascar, to uh, Reunion Island, and on the other side to some of the African countries where they settled, to Mozambique also. Uh, where they settled uh, for trade, but then they were unable to come back. So then they, you know, sort of started living there. And they've been there for two or three generations. And now the younger generation is the current generation, the third generation, in some cases, the second generation. They are all there living as some of them as citizens, some of them still continue to be Indian nationals. So they are still, you know, NRIs. So it's an interesting um, uh, mix of, uh, of uh, diaspora that we have across the world. So if you look at uh, the, uh, the, the different categories, there's one category which has become a complete, uh, a complete uh, uh, sort of a citizen in, in every way uh, of, that, of, the, of the host country. But they have some links with India and where some are still Indian, NRIs, non-resident Indians, and some are you know, there is this one small category which has also become stateless in, in some countries, especially in Madagascar, uh, where they uh, where they sort of when when for instance Madagascar was under the the British for some time, then it went to the French, and at the time of independence they failed or they forgot or whatever uh, they missed to apply for citizenship either of India or of, that ho of the host country of Madagascar. And so today they have no papers, they have nothing to show and they have no citizenship. So they are the stateless, small stateless number of people who are stateless. And we did try to find uh, some uh, solutions for that, but uh, it is, I think, still being looked at how to, uh, how to uh, work it out. Another aspect that I would just like to touch upon or another category of, uh, of uh, diaspora, Indian diaspora is the women. There was a feminization of migration which took place at some point of time. Initially, only the men went as slaves and laborers and indentured uh, labor or, and as business persons. But then after that, the feminization of migration began when they, the, the, the women went along or to join their husbands in some cases. In some cases, they were taken as indentured labor and as slaves to, to, um, to these countries where the, the men had already been taken, again, as workers, but also, you know, for, for giving company and marriages, because Indian, uh, traditionally, Indian, uh, uh, of course, there are exceptions, Indian laborers did not 
intermarry with the locals or with the with the other Africans or the other migrants who were in in that particular country where they were where they had been taken, and they mostly preferred marrying within or with other Indians, and so that was another reason why uh, feminization or migration took place. But again, that has uh, again another second category is the new women migrants who are highly professionally qualified, skilled, and even semi-skilled workers, and have been important contributors to the host and home economies. And they contribute, uh, they constitute a major portion of both the old and new diaspora in all countries. Everywhere you will see, for instance, in the Gulf, you will see huge numbers. And even in, in, in the UK, in the health sector, huge numbers of women in the healthcare sector who have gone there, who are working there, and including in the IT sector. So everywhere, and even in the medical, in, in the, in not only as healthcare, but all, I mean, at the, uh, not only as nurses or semi-skilled, uh, workers, but also as professionally qualified doctors, and of course, management professionals, and you name it, and everywhere uh, the numbers have gone up. And so, then a feminization of the of migration took place over the years, and has continued, and is now quite uh, a part of the and students as, as students as well. It's quite a part of the routine migration and the constitution or the composition of the Indian diaspora. The Indian diaspora is spread across the globe. And as per the Ministry of External Affairs, it is estimated there are 32 million Indian diaspora in 146 countries. Now, these, why do I say estimated or around? Because we don't have exact figures. Because everyone doesn't register with the embassies or with the consulates. And we don't have absolutely, uh, you know, the, the right figures. But we can estimate and guesstimate. And on that basis, we like to call it guesstimate very often on the basis of our dealings with the locals, local Indian origin people, and we form a, a kind of um, estimate that there are so many uh, PIOs and NRIs in that particular country. And when I say NRIs and POIOs, I would also just like to mention, what do you mean by PIOs, persons of Indian origin, uh, and non-resident Indians are those who are still Indian passport holders, but they both together comprise the Indian diaspora. So. <coughs> So, uh, the Indian diaspora, by and large, has been doing very well in every country where they are uh, living, and they have contributed to the local economy, to the growth of the uh, of their industries, and have been important contributors to India's uh, India's growth story as well in many cases. Uh, how? But of course, you all know that uh, they, uh, of course, you know, they, they, there's another element of Indian diaspora that I'd like to mention here. Uh, though they assimilate well in their host societies, they prefer, you know, living or interacting much more uh, with, with their own communities. Of course, they interact with everybody, with the locals as well. Uh, but they prefer having a little more of Indian food and, and maintaining their Indian culture and maintaining their Indianness, so to speak. While, while completely assimilating and, and adapting and adopting the ways of the local host country. And another important thing is that they always have been stressing on education. And that's why if you look at the old diaspora and their children today, their third, fourth, fourth generation, even fifth generation uh, descendants, they're doing extremely well. Uh, they're very highly educated. In every country where they are present, you will see that they're all very highly educated or well educated, if not very highly educated, they're all well educated. This emphasis on education has been a plus point for the Indian diaspora everywhere. And also their attitude to work by and that they work hard, they contribute to the local community and they also try and send back uh, to, the, to India through remittances. And that has been uh, one of the contributors to India's GDP over the years. So you will, you can, this is just to explain to you the kind of diaspora and the kind of uh, when I say diaspora, how are they contributing? How are they participating? How are they connected to India? And they all want to connect to India. That is a great, uh, great um, sort of plus point. But if you look, go back in time a little bit, uh, India had a policy of keeping the diaspora at arm's length. And what was the reason for this? Because India felt that since many of them had become citizens of their host countries, there, there'd be divided loyalties and there would be a problem and they might 
they might spoil our bilateral relations with the host country. So they were, India was a bit reluctant uh, to, to sort of interact or to give them any, uh, any help or I, I, and help or, or interact too much with them as they thought, or it was felt that it would be a kind of interference uh, in their, uh, in their, in, the, in local countries affairs. Uh, and as if the Indian diaspora wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it was being discriminated or was not in a good position. But if you uh, go back in from the 80s, the government changed its approach in a, in a sporadic manner, but we did a, change our approach a bit and, this, and started then. And since the 2000s from the from, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee's uh, time, we embraced our diaspora and focused on tapping the potential of the diaspora. And India recognized that the diaspora are important non-state actors who could potentially influence policy in host countries and contribute to strengthening further bilateral relations. And as India itself, after the economic reforms of 1990, as it became more, uh, it, as it emerged as a growing economy, as its economic prowess increased, plus its educational, um, you know, sort of uh, reputation, so to speak, increased, and people understood that India is no longer the India of the you know, pre-reform times. It is a changed India. It's a mod modernizing India. It's an emerging India. It's an emerging economy. And as India's growth rate increased, everybody began to look at India, including its diaspora. Earlier, the diaspora was hesitant to look at India because they thought, because I, I, I mean, when we interact with some of the people, they said, we didn't want to be known as Indians. We didn't want to because, you know, India has such a bad image. And what was that image of India? It's a poverty-stricken, poor country with snake charmers. On the roads, elephants on the roads, and living in some way back of beyond uh, kind of conditions. Though that may have been true in some pockets of India, which may even be true today, we don't know, in some remote areas. But the general image which was projected the narrative in the in the in, in in the countries in different countries abroad, the world image that we had was unfortunately not the best, and because of that, the diaspora it, themselves did not want to uh, identify themselves as you know or to identify themselves as Indians or say you know we are Indian. They had a little hesitation in doing so. Also, they you know because uh, if you uh, go back in time again. Uh, many of our, uh, the ones who were doing very well professionally were looked after and, were, and lo were looked up to and welcomed when they went there. But the next level of people who went from India did face some degree of discrimination in various countries because they were from India and they were thought to be somehow lesser because of the, the and they would actually ask, even when I went to Paris, for instance, you know, they would ask me, uh, <coughs> sorry, they would ask me, uh, you know, when I would, talk about how India had developed and how things had changed and how uh, there was a technology leap in the telecom sector where people, you know, moved from no phones to mobile phones ubiquitously, you know, almost everywhere there were mobile phones. So when the technology leap took place, uh, we, thought, we you know, we were all saying, we all felt, uh, you know, a great uh, connectivity, so to speak. And people said, and then also I said that we have so many vehicles on the roads and so much manufacturer, Manufacturing is going on and there's a lot of potential for foreign companies to come in and collaborate, et cetera, et cetera. So at one, <coughs> at one school, management school, where I had gone for a kind of uh, lecture. Uh, <coughs> sorry, just give me a moment. <coughs> one student innocently got up and said, you know, you're talking about uh, how lovely and how great India is and how it's developed, etc. And that are not, no, didn't say that. He didn't, sorry, I'm sorry. He said, You're talking about India's manufacturing and how many vehicles are there and how many people are using them and this and that. But how will you drive the vehicles? I said, Why? They're saying, Because he said, Because there are elephants on the road. You know, his perception was that there are elephants all over the country. So I, 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 I was a little taken aback. You know, I said, are you serious? Is that a serious uh, observation or, you know? He said, yes, of course, that's what we know, that everywhere there are elephants. People who go there also say they have elephant rights. I said, yes, they go to places like Jaipur or some other places in South India where the elephants are on, you know, for taking tourists around. 
but we don't have elephants on the road. We have proper roads like you have in France. So of course we have un, you know broken roads as well. There's a lot of uh, you know uh, catching up to do, but we have good roads, and that's where the the cars and the scooters and everybody every, every other vehicle drives on. Oh, she was totally felt very embarrassed. I didn't I mean I was taken aback because I couldn't believe that this was in in 2000 and uh, I think seven maybe when I had gone. And so I was still taken aback, you know, that anybody in, in, in 2007, when, when already the internet uh, and, the, and the, you know, internet explosion had taken place and there was constant people knew everything about everybody, news was all over, that they were, they still had that impression that India was still way, way beyond and living in utter poverty. But unfortunately, you know, to a large extent, I find even nowadays, sometimes in some countries, the impression about India is not the best. Anyway, uh, coming back to what we were talking about, uh, diaspora. So once India became more, you know, self-confident and the GDP growth increased, then the, di the diaspora also started identifying, the, identifying themselves as Indians and their descendants, you know, the, the third and the fourth generation, especially of the indentured labor, etc. They wanted to connect and reconnect with India. And that's when, and, and to invest in India. And that's when they started doing that. But there's one more challenge that we face or that that uh, the diaspora faces when connecting with India, one category. Uh, you may be aware that while we are more aware of the Anglophone uh, diaspora in uh, the English speaking diaspora in, in the US and UK and other some of the other European countries, there is a large segment of Francophone, French speaking diaspora uh, in Africa, in the Indian Ocean, and even in, uh, in, in, in the Caribbean. So then, and we have a third category, the Lusophone, the Portuguese speaking, and a Dutch speaking. So these uh, diaspora find it a little more difficult to interact closely with India because their knowledge of English is not, is not very good. So only those who are able to communicate somewhat in English, somewhat fluently or uh, able to, they are connecting with India and they are have they have really reached out to India and have tried to build bridges and to build collaborations across across the sphere in in culture of course in uh, but also trade and economy and business areas so these challenges with diaspora connecting with India continue uh, have, have will continue for some time but already things are changing because uh, we have to understand that everybody English is the language of the world, you know, we, whatever we say, uh, of course, the Chinese won't agree, the Russians won't agree, many others will not agree with us. But I find that across the world, this is one language which is most widely spoken. Though the French say we are much more, but I think in today's world and in the computer world, everything is, you know, it'll, it'll be, it's, it's an advantage to be bilingual or trilingual. And so they are also understanding and they are beginning to learn English in the Francophone countries and the Lusophone countries. And of course, Anglophone is already quite well connected with India. Uh, an important point is that when the diaspora are um, uh, working outside, especially those from the Gulf, they are remitting huge amounts to the country. And India's diaspora sends, according to the World Bank, around US dollars, 87 billion. In that estimated to uh, to remit in uh, in in 2021 US dollars 87 billion, making India the largest recipient of remittances. So this uh, this is a great um, uh, it's a very great uh, benefit for our economy, and this, this is a kind of partnership because they are of course sending to their homes to their families whatever, but it adds to our GDP and adds to the foreign exchange in the country, and that is a very great uh, plus point for the country and its economic growth. Uh, the next point I would just like to know, you know, the, how, do we, how do we want them to partner the areas, possible areas uh, for partnering uh, uh, with the new India, the modernizing India and the Atma Nirbhar Bharat that we want to create. And of course, at all times is uh, ensuring sustainable development and a kind of eco-friendly kind of development uh, which we are going towards, which India is going towards, and we would like uh, that the diaspora also partners here and Indian companies 
to ensure that this happens or to enable this to happen. The partnership that uh, we are talking about, there are a lot of opportunities and things have changed rapidly in the last few years. And I think there are huge both ways for Indians to collaborate with uh, outside companies and vice versa with, with, with diaspora companies abroad. And opportunities are many. Sustainable development, of course, is a priority for everybody. And in today's consumption driven world, we have to be able to focus on environment, society and the economy. That is planet, people and profit. And all three need to be balanced so that we do not, one does not destroy the other. India is trying to leapfrog into an era of energy self-sufficiency and to rapidly transform lives through harnessing solar energy, adopting electric vehicles, uh, both of which are, of course, uh, you know, environment friendly and sustainable solutions. And already we are working with some diaspora companies to make this happen. And as India focuses on Make in India and Atma Nirbhar Bharat, after especially COVID, we have realized how the supply chains were disrupted and how we were, you know, we could be held to ransom. And so now the focus is on Make in India and Atman Nirbhar Bharat to, to diversify and, and to ensure resilient supply chains for all our uh, needs. And so the Indian diaspora is being encouraged and it should be encouraged to invest in both greenfield and brownfield projects to make, as I said, resilient supply chains and to also make in India for other countries. Now, India has, of course, been uh, facilitating and making things easier. Ease of doing business in India has improved from 130 to 66 in 2020. And rules have been rationalized for investments by including OCIs, that's, of, that's um, overseas citizens of India, in the definition of the Indian management control in sensitive areas. So we need to now co-opt the diaspora with the new India to ensure this sustainable economic growth. And some of the um, categories uh, I would just like to mention, uh, the different categories, as I said, uh, across different countries have different expectations from India and their partnership would also be of a different kind in each category. A one size fits all approach would not be possible and would be actually counterproductive. So we have to go uh, for, with each as a, as a specific case or a specific category of cases. And as I said earlier, linguistic diaspora are also a unique, uh, have their unique challenges, the Francophone and the Lusophone uh, diaspora and the Dutch speaking diaspora. So we need to uh, factor in all these, uh, make it into a win-win a, a situation for, every, for both sides. Uh, in general, the American Indian diaspora is looking to India for investment opportunities. Diaspora in the Gulf is looking to India for welfare issues. And they're of course sending huge uh, remittances, uh, remittances to their families, which is of course helping us, uh, helping the country. And the Girmitya, the, the indentured labor are also referred to sometimes as the Girmitya diaspora. Their descendants are looking to India for a cultural connect and have a deep seated need to be embraced by India. India's hesitation sometimes in acknowledging their Indianness uh, sometimes makes, because of their, also because of their language issues, they sometimes feel a little, uh, disappointed. But it is again, as I said, changing and India has put in place a lot of policies to encourage all, all the different categories to interact with, uh, you know, more with India and to also to, to, to meet their sort of expectations wherever possible. The diaspora would like to collaborate with Indian entities in science and technology, innovative technology solutions, and to benefit and learn from India's developmental journey, including the frugal engineering models adapted by Indian companies. So that's another area where we are, um, you know, encouraging them and also putting companies. We have the embassies and the government, uh, while not directly, of course, uh, you know, setting up these companies or, uh, or you know, getting involved in that. Put companies or startups together, SMEs, MSMEs, all of them together to enable them to work together and to come up with uh, these, uh, with, come up with new and innovative solutions to what is today's, uh, what is the requirement in the world today. Uh, as you know, in the US and EU, India's diaspora is at the forefront of cutting edge technological innovations and are setting up startups in emerging and disruptive technologies like the digital economy, renewable energies, artificial intelligence, uh, economy, blockchain, and of course, 
the metaverse is a new and an augmented reality. These are all, you know, cutting edge and happening uh, uh, sort of technologies which are going to be our future, whether we like it or not. And many Indian companies and Indian origin startups are working in this area. And India is encouraging and should encourage collaborations with our local Indian startups and make connections to tap the expertise and encourage them to collaborate with frugal innovators within India and to ensure that India has an advantage at this stage of its development with sustainability at the core. That is one thing which we must make sure that is eco-friendly and sustainable. Because as going forward, we should try and get rid of earlier uh, non-eco-friendly technologies and come up with newer uh, technologies which are sustainable and eco-friendly, environment-friendly and uh, ecology-friendly. And another, uh, this is just a suggestion that I have, that is important that the new framework that we get, in, get on board should take elements of traditional knowledge and practices in, in, in India, which have been handed down over generations and are crucial to a sustainable future. Now, if you talk about Ayurveda or you talk about other, you know, uh, technologies or other, uh, you know, even in our uh, eating and in our cooking methodologies, and even in our traditions that we have uh, over the years, some of them could really uh, have a beneficial effect in every area, health, wellness, uh, development. And for a win-win outcome, startups could share knowledge and set up uh, joint ventures with Indian innovators and startups as an integral part of the Make in India initiative and monetize these innovations and thus create more jobs and growth. As I said, combining traditional know-how with new high technology would be a win-win scenario for everyone. The, for example, the use of blockchain technology, technology to share information in the agriculture sector between all stakeholders to choose the crop for sowing, both according to season and demand, using traditional knowledge methods of fertilizing without chemicals, what we call today organic, based on shared information, updating of land records, which is very, very crucial in India and in other developing countries as well, who could benefit with this new kind of, uh, you know, what platforms that we would, uh, which there's already being done, but much more needs to be done. And setting up digital infrastructure for agriculture and an e-governance architecture, especially in rural areas, are crucial areas where the diaspora investment and collaborations could take place. Other areas where I feel, in, in, you know, uh, collaborations are taking place, but should take place on a, on a small scale, they are taking place, but need to be wrapped up. Healthcare, where traditional medicine combined with access to telemedicine and latest e-diagnostic tools could transform lives. Traditional mechanisms of water storage should be revived along with water, modern water management systems, and in general following age-old practices of living in harmony with nature to, to, sorry, to ensure sustainability in day-to-day -day living. And India's initiative of setting up the International Solar Alliance uh, with a $1 trillion fund is aimed at accelerating the pace and production and the use of solar energy and offers scope for joint research, localization, absorption of local traditional solutions and co-opting, again, frugal innovative solutions. <coughs> and these, uh, the solar fund needs to be used to, and is required to be used and is supposed to be used for R&D and financing solar projects and to establish stand and of course to establish standards and protocols for the use and spread of solar energy to enable countries across the economic spectrum to adopt and reap the environmental and climate benefits as well as achieve economic prosperity through the availability of relatively inexpensive and sustainable renewable energy source resource so indian diaspora is also working in this and this is a great area where we can where we can collaborate and where the indian diaspora can partner with india in, in further improving and increasing the spread of this uh, of, of solar energy, which as all of you would agree is, you know, the, the, the technology, the energy source is free, but the technology required to harness it and to distribute it is what requires the money and which can be made more and more efficient using modern technology and the latest IT tools. <clears throat> the Indian diaspora, as I said, has been contributing already 
uh, through remittances and has gone a long way in reducing household poverty, improving education, health, in, uh, entrepreneurship opportunities, and has been a driver in increasing prosperity and modernizing societies. For instance, you know the, 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 the diaspora from Punjab, from Kerala, and many, other, and even in Gujarat, have been sending huge remittances to their, and even in UP, have been sending remittances to their hometowns and encouraging uh, investments in, in improving their infrastructure and modernizing their home, home villages. And that has happened. And it is a time that we scale up both physical and digital infrastructure in different parts of the country. And the diaspora has been contributing, but needs to do much. And we need to harness and to get more of them uh, to, to come in. Of course, some diaspora companies have been active in, in knowledge transfer to Indian entities and turn the so-called brain drain that had taken place to a brain gain, as was articulated by our Prime Minister some time back. This knowledge transfer is important in the IT telecom sectors and in the financial sectors to enable further economic rejuvenation. Philanthropy is another area that the diaspora has been contributing to regularly through setting up of NGOs and charitable institutions in the areas of health, education, water management, rural development, and funding of self-help groups. In rural Influential diaspora have also served as lobby groups. And as we saw in the case of the nuclear deal, the, the, the diaspora, the well of diaspora there did play a role in turning, in, 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 in turning the, the sort of uh, the, the policy towards India, making it favorable towards India, and we signed the nuclear deal. There have also been there another small, it's a small bit, but uh, another contribution of the economic uh, ties between, uh, between the diaspora and, 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 and India is that the large diaspora has been importing or buying products from India, not only for their personal use, but also on a commercial basis. You know, like food, of course, and uh, Indian fabrics, handicrafts, garments, spices, etc. And they've been adding to the overall two-way trade with India and their host country. And uh, it's interesting, I haven't mentioned it here, but Bollywood has been a great connector uh, between uh, diaspora communities and India. And they feel a particular connect uh, with India, but even the locals, you know, not only do uh, the uh, Indian origin people, uh, you know, feel connected more because of Bollywood, but also local. Uh, in Madagascar, for instance, you know, I had gone to a for a meeting and suddenly to a hotel and suddenly I find a, a marriage taking place and I just said, what's happening here? And there was this girl standing there who was wearing a lehenga, a local Malagasy girl who was wearing a, a, a lehenga, beautiful Indian lehenga. And the, bra, bra, and the bridegroom was in a Indian, uh, uh, Indian, uh, what should I say? Indian, what is it called? Uh, uh, the Safa and, and, and he had a... Uh, and uh, you know the, the kurta very smart thing uh, you know typical Indian uh, bridegroom's dress he was wearing and they had garlands in their hands I said oh wow do you do this as well they said yeah because we see it in Bollywood and uh, we uh, um, you know we feel very connected with India we watch all your series we watch every movie whichever comes in you know with, uh, dubbed in French and we love Indian culture and we love Indian food and I said but uh, you, you know you're getting married with an Indian pandit or something they said no we've already had our church wedding and uh, we're going to have this Indian style wedding today at the hotel so this is very interesting this is, by the way I just remembered an incident so I just mentioned it. it's a very interesting thing that how India India's influence and its diaspora also influence the way the local uh, people uh, you know uh, behave or, or, or conduct their uh, certificates. Do I have some time or should I conclude now? Pardon? I have some time. I can't hear you. Uh, it's for you. I mean, uh, oh, all right. I have some time. All right. So I'll, I'll just take a little, a few more minutes and then we can open up for question answers if it's okay with you. Uh, now, <coughs> sorry. You take water, please. Pardon? And uh, I just conclude now, I think, with a few um, com uh, comments. Uh, as India emerged, as I mentioned, economically and began to take its rightful place, uh, India 
needed needs to build further on the existing links with the diaspora and tap into their longing for being invested in india's growth and to partner with diaspora across the world for creating as i said a framework for a sustainable development model to be implemented in india and replicated in the rest of the developing world it's interesting that india's approach for the south for south south cooperation under the development partnership program uh, it does uh, you know uh, help and they look they're looking they don't want uh, traditional uh, uh, you know solutions they're looking at india and saying well, how is how are things working like in your country you know uh, how did you manage to do it at such a low cost when we are doing it it's costing so much so they're looking at india to see how we have followed a particular developmental path and they're looking for us uh, to to implement or to share our technology our developmental uh, experience with them which we have been doing and the indian business diaspora in different countries can be leveraged to conclude win win trading agreements and to have a community to listen for both sides economic linkages create stakeholders and hence it is essential to build a comprehensive and transparent architecture to increase to engage economically with the diaspora the diaspora of course looking to india to reembrace them handhold them and partner with them they are really looking at india and if we go back uh, the the event was held in 2017 in varanasi if i'm not mistaken i think it was varanasi they put special focus on involving diaspora in business investing in capacity building in swachh bharat mission digital india and entrepreneurship and including in startup india and that was uh, enunciated at that pbd and a lot of diaspora entrepreneurs and uh, well off uh, business persons did respond to this and slowly we find that things have started happening of course it's not on a huge scale because you know, up, you know up, until recently it was quite difficult to get clearances in india and uh, even now though things have become much much better i still hear sometimes people telling me it's a problem how do i do this how do i do that i said it's all online they say no it's not online it's it's there online but we have been following up and following up so please help out still sometimes there are cases where it doesn't go as smoothly as uh, if you are like and as we would like to emerging challenges of creating adequate and the blue economy and of course leveraging artificial intelligence etc need to be addressed and integrated with sustainable development planning as i said and we need to again rope in our diaspora to invest and to see how we can make things better especially uh, you know have a system i think of adopting developed villages in india and our flagship initiatives which are there swachh bharat capacity building etc etc we need to have these well off diaspora adapt and adopt adopt villages and ensure that they uh, that they uh, sort of uh, flourish one last point that i'd like to make is women need to be involved in the economic and developmental bandwagon and i think that is one important thing we cannot afford to leave the um, the, the women out and we need to have including the diaspora women indian women of course and entrepreneurs but also the diaspora spora women entrepreneurs need to be encouraged to get uh, to to be a part of this uh, uh, this growth story or this collaboration or this partnership so diaspora also needs to be encouraged to invest in women centric enterprises startups and women self help groups in rural areas helping them to lift out of poverty and help in imparting a sense of dignity to many of the marginalized sex, uh, sections of society and i will conclude that another development has been the reverse brain drain that has been taking place and seeing many well qualified well off diaspora professionals coming to india to set up knowledge based enterprises in india and be involved in philanthropic activities in a big way some women diaspora have also been a part of this trend but their numbers are small and another last point the concept of nation building is evolving and economic prosperity economic inclusion and economic development are the bedrock of a nation's sense of self and its place in the globalizing world and so we need to get out diaspora of course we need to do many things but diaspora diaspora diplomacy is an important part of our foreign policy and getting our diaspora on board as part of our journey for atmanirbhar bharat for 
uh, innovation and for ensuring a, 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 a sort of sustainable and uh, eco economic ecology friendly uh, environment friendly uh, growth model development model would be the interests of everybody and a win win situation uh, and be a win win for all concerned I, I will conclude now thank you so much for joining me out any questions i will be happy to answer thank you so much uh, thank you madam ambassador you have come uh, forward the subject so comprehensively that i don't think uh, we can have any questions about the subject that you have uh, spoken about it uh, even then uh, i will ask the uh, participant to uh, put their questions please be brief and introduce yourself first come on be quick yes you can unmute yourself and uh, ask questions and uh, uh, yes come on who is going to take the initiative the big... of course he has explained everything and very uh, comprehensive of it and uh, uh, I don't expect uh, any questions, but uh, even then the students are always curious to ask questions. Uh, yes, sir. So can I go? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, uh, Ambassador Seth. Firstly, it, it's your video. Your video. Your video. <clears throat> Come on, be quick. Yes. So, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. on, be quick. Be quick. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Ambassador. Firstly, it's uh, very uh, nice to e hear out from a female uh, ambassador because so far you just had one female ambassador and you're the second one. So, thank you for that. It's really inspiring. Uh, so, uh, Ambassador, my question to you is that, uh, like, it's much of a practical question because, as Sir mentioned, you've covered all the aspects of uh, diaspora. Uh, what role does the embassy play in various countries? And what is the role of the embassy in, or the relationship of the embassy with the diasporic community in any country? Uh, earlier, as we said some year, as I said some years ago, there was a, you know, keeping the, the community at arm's length. There was hardly any interaction at all, except inviting them for, you know, our national day functions, you know. And then as we realized and as we became active in diaspora di uh, uh, diplomacy, and we understood, and they understood that we, uh, India was important and we understood their importance, we started interacting them, with them much closely in all our embassies. We have close interaction uh, with the diaspora. And we, uh, also, uh, you know, we put them in touch when, whenever we have uh, sort of, uh, we facilitate their coming to India or, and their business uh, uh, business. Uh, uh, if they are interested in doing business, we put them in touch with the right facilitate on the Indian side the, uh, with organizations or with whoever can facilitate their uh, work in India. The embassies are now quite active in, in promoting um, uh, uh, diaspora diplomacy and promoting diaspora involvement and, uh, and uh, in, in, in India's development story, uh, growth story. Uh, but very often, or sometimes, I mean, not say very often, but sometimes we can't be as active as we want, as we, you know, due to uh, personnel constraints. We don't have enough people uh, to do, uh, uh, to, to deal only with the diaspora. So we have, uh, or to focus exclusively on the diaspora. So we do have people dealing with the diaspora, but we cannot give them more, as much time as we would like to. And because of constraints, manpower constraints, sometimes, uh, we are unable to, not only for the diaspora, but even other local people, we are unable to answer or to facilitate their business inquiries or other issues on, in, in the way that we would like to. Uh, of course, uh, we do facilitate and give them special, and now with the OCI card and all, they can travel without any problems. But some of the issues, like for instance, I remember one person came to me, one business person said that he wanted, you know, he had invested in India and he'd been, you know, 
taken for a ride. His partner in India said, I'll do this, I'll do that. But one fine day he disappeared and they wanted us to help. So I said, we can certainly pass on your, you please give your complaint. We will help you we'll see. But beyond that, the embassy is unable to actually uh, do the investigation on its own or to insist that the local uh, police or whoever the local agency is to inquire into into that particular problem uh, will, uh, will uh, you know, do it as efficiently and find the culprit and find and, and do some uh, take some kind of uh, action a penal action on that particular person so to that extent uh, we have a little, some constraints but we definitely try to help him and we've told everybody locally and the chambers and everywhere uh, in, in it was in Mumbai and we Put our, we told our ministry and we also told our Bombay, we have an, you know, the passport office there. We told them also that this is a constraint that we have, uh, this is a problem that has been uh, faced by one of the diaspora. This person, so see if you can do something. But I'm not sure anything came of it, but we did try and make the effort, but we don't know what came of it because of, again, man Yeah, next question. Yeah, next question. Thank you, Ambassador. Welcome. Well. Good evening, Ambassador. Good evening. Uh, I am Akriti, uh, finally a student of Master's International Relations. Uh, Ambassador, I had a question uh, regarding the blue economy. So you mentioned about the blue economy. Yes, I yes. just wanted to, uh, you know, like ask or how diaspora plays a role in, uh, in the blue economy is because see, they are, uh, say, for instance, living in the Indian Ocean country. And they are involved in, uh, in in harnessing the blue economy. When we talk of the blue economy, we're talking of, uh, you know, they are mainly, of course, involved in the, uh, say, in the fishing or the, uh, uh, you know, uh, prawn cultivation and, and, you know, those uh, uh, areas. But the blue economy goes much beyond that. And they are, uh, you know, and to have these business persons who are already working on this uh, to collaborate. Uh, with Indian um, Indian businesses in the blue economy, I think will help to make things better and make it more efficient. People also, some people did approach us for this uh, when I was in Madagascar, saying that we are involved in this, but we want to learn better methods and we want to do. Of course, the the the, the Western methods we already know, but we know in India they they do it in small areas and their productivity is much higher. So those kind of things, and of course, the other aspect of blue economy is for. Uh, you know, the, the, the rare earths and the other elements found uh, in the... That is uh, not something that I think the diaspora would be able to find in it, but it be, or be able to be uh, this thing, because I think they're the sovereign countries or the sovereign governments usually uh, get into that area. But for fisheries and fishing and other sea uh, related, uh, you know, even, even uh, you know, if you uh, see that, you know, a lot of sea, uh, what's the word, sea algae and sea weeds, etc. And of course, fish, other other fisheries and related marine products or marine edible products for for their manufacturing or for their production, uh, there have been there have been requests for collaboration, and I think that's an area where it can be picked up much more. It can be developed much more by sharing the way or the methodologies that are adopted by them, by the by the diaspora people in the and on the Indian side. So, ma'am, it is an emerging. Uh, yeah. it's emerging, like, emerging, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and there Next are many multi-level uh, stakeholders. Absolutely, well. absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for Next the question. session as well. Yeah. Next question. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, Shreya side. I am pursuing my master's from Amity University in international relations. My question is that, ma'am, since there are so there, many there Indian... video, video, Madam wants to see you. So yeah, I can see. I can see. She's visible. Okay. Okay. So actually, ma'am, my question is: since so many Indians are living abroad, and since you told us that you had an interaction, and one of the uh, person had this uh, perception of India that we still have undeveloped roads and everything. So, ma'am, do you uh, think that some uh, it has some kind of media influences involved in kind of narrative? Of Since course. so many uh, uh, people are living abroad, they are doing so much uh, well in their respective uh, domains abroad and uh, making our country so proud. And then uh, when we hear this kind of uh, narratives that India is not developed and uh, we are so backward, so, ma'am, uh, does it make you feel like, uh, like, where is it coming from? 
Absolutely. There is, of course, this uh, attempt in the international, not attempt, it has been going on, uh, of portraying India in uh, not a very positive light. If you see all the media, even today, foreign media focuses on all the negatives, on all the negatives happening in India. I don't recall any, uh, very many positive stories about what naturally anyone in that in, in, in a, another country will see or believe what has come in the media and think this is all of India. For instance, a recent uh, you know, controversy in, in Karnataka is one small uh, town in, in Karnataka and there was an uh, international uh, condemnation, an international focus on that. And everybody thinks now all of India is in that kind of uh, situation. And people, and this kind of thing used to happen even when we were uh, working, when I was working in Paris and in Bangkok once, when something was a small incident, some small remote uh, area to, told us, because everywhere the media was focusing, the foreign media was focusing just on that. And they said, you are saying this, 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 and look what is happening in your country. The whole country is burning. The whole country is having this, that, you know, when, when in Gujarat, the uh, thing took place. And they kept telling us that, you know, your whole country is uh, communal and it's caste-based and it's this, it's that, you know, all negative. In every conference I went to, there would be at least two people saying, why is caste so important in your country? Why is caste focused? Why are you so casteist? Why are you so discriminatory? Why is it so bad? Is it in, 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 I say to them that, yes, in some villages, remote areas, it might be a factor, it might be a factor in, when, when people get married. That's a factor in your country too. You would not get married to uh, somebody whose uh, you know, profession is not uh, matching yours in the normal course. Uh, you would not want your children to be married to somebody who's not of your level. And that is a fact, you know, and especially uh, about the about the focus of the media coming back, the focus of the media is always on what they think. They feel that what what will sell is negative stories, negative coverage, and also I feel that has been over the years an in, an attempt not only now, right, for many years, because I used to also be in the internal publicity division of the Ministry of Transport, and I saw these people would come to us and say we want to go to this place where there's the most back of beyond that they are going to and they were making a documentary on that and then actually they were supposed to submit something to us of what they're going to show eventually so we were examining those documentaries and we found that they they that there were some issues that we were not very comfortable with so they deleted it they said okay we'll delete it but i believe that it was actually you know telecast in that country again because then we asked our embassy to keep an eye on that. and it was they had added more. We had cleared a particular thing, but they had added even more negative stuff uh, when they eventually took it. This kind of thing happening because they feel that that's negativity and people's woes and poverty is what sells. So, and also there has been an attempt, I think, over the years to keep uh, India a bit in its place, to remain in your place, I think. So what is happening? Then how would, uh, as an ambassador, then how would you deal with, uh, deal with uh, such kind of negativity? When you do it? We follow, uh, you know, India, uh, Indians in general, I'm not talking about the embassy, we in general don't, we're not very, um, you know, aggressive in our, uh, uh, in encountering such things. We say it's there for everyone to see, you know, what are they talking about? Our general attitude is that. But of course, when we are in the embassy, we have to counter it and we counter it. And we do try and spread a positive narrative. As I told you, even that student, and I told him India is, India is doing this, he was still one plus. But when I explained to him, he understood that all the other students in that class, about 50, 60 of them, they all said, yes, India is about and thank you for telling us. We were totally so we just do make that effort, all embassies make that effort, and some succeed, some don't. Yes, yes. Now, 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 now the last question, last question. Yes, last question. Uh, otherwise, uh, so, as a student, question, yeah, yeah. question. So, ma'am, just, just as you mentioned about that, when you told them 
uh, when you told the students that what India is doing right now. So we we can just generally presume or assume that they have this uh, you know preconception, pre notion in them that India is like that. India is a developing country, or there is this uh, these things are underlying in the country and all. So um, why is this so? Like because they have been told from. the very starting you know that india is a developing country if you ever go there you will find uh, you will find uh, difficulties in doing tasks and everything absolutely so like why is this uh, you know uh, notion in in them like uh, i feel because you know what has happened over the years when people come to india again most of them they don't uh, if uh, the ones who come to the main cities uh, they don't see anything say for instance when they go to <clears throat> If you go to Agra, <clears throat> sorry, I'm sorry. <clears throat> If you go to the Taj Mahal and you are approaching the Taj Mahal, uh, as you go there, you can see, you know, development and poverty side by side. and this is there uh, and in in delhi also for instance you'll find the beggars you'll find the people under the you know, flyover you'll find people living in in really sad state of affairs so on one hand you have this developed india on the other hand you have a section of people who are really really in a pathetic state and so when these people come to india also they journalists of course always focus on the on the on these poor people on the beggars who unfortunately very often and they come here into the city looking for better jobs and are unable to do anything so they are living on the streets on the pavement and even in the indian media if you see there are regular stories about about people who are living on the on the pavements in different in, in mumbai over here the slums of mumbai the slums of delhi when even the media covers these or even when tourists go back they also generally say yes everything in this part is great but the focus is always on saying how sad it was for them how terrible it was that they saw all this terrible uh, you know humanity and they were feed and so that narrative gets repeated replicated and it gets spread and everybody focuses on that but my my thing used to be whenever people told me this i would say please look at your own country as well is there no poverty there is poverty in in europe there's extreme poverty not even poverty is extreme poverty in europe sections of it yes ma'am extreme poverty in in the us we've seen their total ghettos which are full of poor people and look, living in some cases worse than they live in uh, in india the conditions in india so in in their in their migrant housing in europe it's quite bad so it's not that it doesn't exist but it's been managed very nicely you don't see it, you know you don't see beggars on the road as such yes ma'am they they're put aside you know and so which we are not doing we say okay it's there for you to see and that and the focus is on the narrative so that's what gets amplified and is the narrative that is promoted across the world and there's a slight agenda to keep in 